Okay, so good morning everybody. My name is Stefano Verde and I work as a researcher at the Climate Policy Research Unit of the European University Institute. I'm going to give a presentation on the distributional implications of support for renewable electricity. Okay, so the presentation is structured in three parts. In the first part, I'll uh, give some background information. The idea is to uh, explain, to outline the nature of the problem and provide a conceptual framework. The second part, uh, I will present the, the highlights of a work that, I, uh, that I've done with Professor Maria Grazia Pazienza of the University of Florence, and which is titled Cost Recovery of Resist Support in Italy, a new case for a carbon tax, resistance for renewable electricity. This work has been published as a working paper of the European University Institute, which end is uh, freely accessible online. So in this part of the presentation, I will, uh, I will show some relevant facts uh, referring to the Italian case and the results of a simulation that we carry out in which we uh, compare the distribu distributional incidence of the A3, which is the uh, renewable electricity surcharge in Italy, vis-à-vis -vis a hypothetical carbon tax. Then we will wrap up with uh, conclusions and general remarks. Okay, let's start. Um, well, the starting point is the uh, climate and energy package, which is the uh, legislative, legislative basis for, uh, of the EU's strategy in climate and energy policy uh, to 2020. Two binding targets are set uh, by the climate and energy package. One concerns um, the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, and specifically a 20% reduction below the 1990 level, this is a target for the EU as a whole. And the other target is for renewable energy. 20% of renewable energy must be, uh, must be achieved in total energy consumption, again, at the EU level. Targets, of course, uh, need instrument if they are to be met. And, well, carbon pricing is the natural instrument for, uh, uh, for reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Carbon pricing literally means uh, to put a price on carbon. And so this translates into two types of uh, instruments. One is uh, emission trading. And if we think of the EU, well, we have a perfect example, uh, the, which is the EU emission trading scheme. And the other one is carbon taxation. As concerns renewable energy, well, this is, I mean, uh, the target uh, is, uh, is, is sought through a, a direct support to renewable energy. And there's a range of, of instruments that are used uh, among these feeding tariffs and feeding premiums, tender schemes, green certificates, and tax benefits. There are also standards and command and control policies that are implemented in the EU at various levels, but uh, we can think of them as residual and complementary to uh, carbon pricing and direct res support. Now, who pays? This is really the, uh, well, a core question of, uh, of this presentation. So who pays for these instruments? Well, carbon pricing raises energy prices in proportion of the carbon content of the, of the given fuel. So we can say that by definition, it is consumers uh, who pay for them, for, for, for it. Uh, this is not true for a rest support, which can be financed either by the government or end users. So it is either taxpayers or consumers who pay, or both. I mean, the, uh, the, the, the cost can be shared uh, by the two. This is true in, this was true in, uh, is true in, uh, in principle. Now, what, in this respect, what, did we, what have you observed uh, uh, over the recent past? Who has been paying for, uh, for, for, uh, for the climate and energy package, basically? Um, well, the recent trend following the, as a result of the economic crisis, based, uh, fundamentally, has been weak carbon pricing on, on the one hand, and I'm thinking, of course, of the low level of the price of carbon in the, in the UETS, and on the other hand, uh, strong, pretty strong res support, especially of support for, renew support for renewable electricity. Now, in the vast majority of member states, support for renewable electricity is largely paid by electricity consumers. And it is the case that uh, res support is often pointed as the main culprit of 
uh, electricity price increases. It is true that uh, electricity has become more expensive in the, in, the, in the last few years. Here I show you um, the evolution of the consumer price index, the CPI, vis-a-vis -vis the CPI for, uh, for electricity uh, specifically. Now this graph refers to Germany and the, uh, over, the time, over the period 2005-2012 and clear, it's clear that the price of the CPI for, of electricity has grown uh, considerably faster than the general CPI. This is true not only for Germany, but also for Italy, for the UK, uh, for Spain. And in general, it's true for uh, almost all, uh, most if not all uh, EU member states. Now, just a, a quick um, digression to say a word of, of caution in, uh, in defense, let's say, of renewable electricity. Um, this may be a, a concept, uh, well, a, a superfluous for people who are familiar already with, uh, with this uh, topic, but it, it may not be the case for, for everyone. So let me just remind you that renewable electricity has zero marginal cost, and uh, for this reason, um, a, a greater share of renewable electricity in, the, in, the, in supply has the effect of lowering the, the, the wholesale price. Okay, so this, is a me, this, called, this effect is called merit order effect. And uh, therefore, at least we can say that at least part of a RESI surcharge, of a surcharge for supporting renewable electricity, is compensated at least, at least in part by this type of saving, saving by the merit order effect saving. Of course, for, for, uh, if there are consumers who uh, categories of consumers that are exempted from paying the, the RESI surcharge, then a greater share of renewable electricity in the generation mix will be a net benefit for them. We'll see that that's the case, uh, well, it, it is the case in Germany, for instance, and uh, in Italy, and I assume in other, uh, I would imagine in other countries as well. Now, um, having closed this uh, digression, uh, there is one obvious distributional effect associated with a, 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 an increase in the price of electricity. And, uh, and I'll explain it now. Uh, electricity is a typical necessity good. It's a necessity good par excellence, uh, we could say. And, and therefore, it is to say that low-income households, it is the case that low-income households spend a greater, greater proportions of their income on electricity. On electricity. These in turn, means, implies that electricity price increases are regressive, which means, in relative terms, low-income households carry a greater burden than better-off households. So essentially, are unfair. But this is not all the story, this is not the only distributional effect uh, that exists. Um, so here I show you a graph that is taken from a work of uh, Dan Fallerton. It's also accessible, free accessible online. And uh, yes, this work was t uh, titled Six Distributional Effects of, en of Environmental Policy. It originally was used for, uh, I mean, Fallerton uses it for showing the, uh, in a very stylized way, the uh, distribution effects associated with uh, carbon, pri carbon pricing. Uh, or caused by uh, carbon pricing, but we can easily uh, adapt it and uh, reinterpret it for uh, a renewable electricity surcharge. Okay, so here on the horizontal axis we have the quantity of the good in question, electricity. On the vertical axis we have the price of electricity. This, of course, is the demand curve. This, positively inclined, is the supply curve. This, Q0, is the equilibrium price. Initial equilibrium, uh, sorry, <laughs> initial equilibrium quantity. Uh, P0 is the initial equilibrium price. Now, when the surcharge, the, the renewable electricity surcharge is introduced, well, it acts effectively as an excise tax. So effectively, there's a, a wage is brought in between the demand curve and the supply curve. Okay, so Q prime become, is the new uh, equilibrium quantity that is supplied and consumed. Uh, this is the price received by uh, the producer, and this is the price paid by the consumer. 
the difference between the two is the amount of the, of the surcharge, is the surcharge itself. Okay, so there are six uh, effects, as, the, as I said before, um, that are determined. Um, one effect is on consumers, and it's, re it's uh, represented by the area AD, and this effect amounts to the, to the fact that less is consumed and more is, is paid for, the, for what is consumed. Um, there's then the effect that impacts on uh, producers or, or in a more general sense to owners of primary factors, labor and capital, and it's represented by the area BE, so it's the effect uh, due to the fact that lower, uh, a lower amount of quantity is supplied can be su and, and uh, indirectly quantity of, uh, of labor is employed, of capital is employed, is supplied and employed uh, and a lower price is received, so the remuneration of the factors is lower. A third effect is the subsidy that goes to generators of renewable electricity and is represented by uh, the area AB. Uh, the fourth effect is the effect of environmental protection, okay, represented by the area C, D, E. A fifth effect is the cost of the transition, so essentially re-employing those factors that have, are, have been uh, displaced by, as a result of the, uh, the reduction in, in quantity supplied and demanded. So they will have labor, uh, will have, some labor will have to be retrained, uh, capital will have to be reallocated to other sectors, and so on. And then there's a sixth effect that is not uh, visible on the, uh, on the graph, which is the effect on asset prices. So this can be effects on the, on the value of uh, um, corporate stocks, or on the value of land, or houses, or assets in general. Now, each of these effects can have a more or less uh, regressive or regressive uh, incidence. Okay, now one uh, for each of them, one could would could bring arguments in favor of regressiveness or progressiveness. So we are not going to, into that. But for sure, the first the first type of effect, the one on consumers, is regressive, and it's regressive for what I said before that electricity is. A necessity. It's a necessity good. So it's in, uh, the impact on it of a price increase is regressive. Also, I could ar one could uh, make the argument that the subsidy, uh, the subsidy as a regressive uh, effect, uh, to the extent that richer households gets, in relative term, gets more of that uh, subsidy. I think that one case in which this is more obvious is in, uh, in the case of subsidies to photovoltaic uh, panels on, on rooftop photovoltaic panels, um, where if it is the case, and there are studies that show that that, that is the case, um, if it is the case that it is more, it is, it is uh, more wealthier households that get the, that do this type of, in, of, of investment and therefore get the subsidy, then it is a, a regressive, uh, it has a regressive uh, impact. Okay, this was just to say that we focus uh, in the remainder of, of, uh, of my presentation uh, on the impact on consumers, on consumption, on the distribution impact through consumption, but there are other, a whole, there, uh, there are other effects as well that we should at least be aware of. Okay, let's move to the second uh, part of the presentation. Uh, so the the paper, the, the paper. First, some facts, some facts about uh, renewable electricity in Italy. This graph shows the evolution of uh, uh, renewable electricity generation by technology, and here the uh, orange curve uh, is the curve of photovoltaic. And uh, I think it's the most obvious, uh, most interesting element of the last few years. I mean, clearly there has been a, a jump in photovoltaic uh, generation. 
And in 2012, 20% uh, of renewable electricity in total electricity consumption has been reached. Italy self-imposed a target of 28% to be reached by 2020, so uh, this target has been almost reached uh, with a, a few years in advance. And this graph, well, it's, uh, it's similar, except that it refers to installed capacity. And again, here the, uh, the growth of uh, photovoltaic generation is even more uh, evident. In 2011, 9.3 uh, gigawatts of new, install cap uh, new capacity in photovoltaic capacity were installed, and it was the, uh, yeah, the, record, the, re the world record uh, that year. So we really had a boom in photovoltaics uh, in Italy in the last couple of years. This did not happen uh, by chance, of course, but there were some substantial support uh, mechanism in place. The, the main ones were the, these four. Conto Energia Photovoltaico, it's a feeling tariff for uh, photovoltaics only. Uh, Tarifa Onicomprensiva is a feeling tariff for non-photovoltaic small plants. Certificate Verdi is a, a green uh, certificate scheme. And chip say is a feed-in tariff, uh, like the first mechanism that was uh, introduced and be, has been largely replaced by green certificates. Um, so it's gradually uh, uh, being uh, substituted. Just as well, certificate certificate where they are going to be uh, substituted. In, uh, well, as of this year, actually. Uh, but we are looking at the past, so. Uh, these are the, uh, the main mechanisms that have been in place in the past. Okay, so the, um, I think for photovoltaics, I said it was a feeding tariff, it was actually a, a feeding premium. But anyway, the, the upper chart uh, is, uh, well, shows the evolution of the costs of the, of the four mechanisms, and the lower chart, the evolution of the generation under the four mechanisms. Uh, I just draw your attention to the uh, steep increase in both in costs and generation, probably mainly in, mainly in costs, uh, well, at least more in the cost, proportionally more in the cost of, uh, the, of photovoltaics, so of the mechanism uh, supporting photovoltaic generation. So in 2012, the cost of support to renewable electricity uh, past 10 billion uh, per year, and uh, more than 9 billion of these were recovered through the uh, A3 surcharge. So it's a substantial uh, amount. Now, the rates of the A3, uh, there's not just one, trait, one rate, but there are uh, several. So at the beginning of 2008, um, these were the rates in, in force. The, the rates in force. Uh, the upper table refers to uh, residential users, and the uh, lower table to industry users. In the body of the tables, you have the rates. These are differentiated by uh, user type. Fundamentally, uh, the uh, le the level of capacity, uh, committed capacity, and level of consumption. Now, you can see that the rates were, in 2008, still very low, 0 .03, 0 0.03 cents per kilowatt hour, and pre, pretty homogeneous across the board. I mean, everywhere except 0 0.04 here. And of course, this is the main uh, point, I'd say. Um, higher, higher levels, ha, ha, the highest level of consumption were exempted uh, from contributing to the support, to the financing of support to renewable electricity, okay? I know that this is the case also in, uh, in, uh, in Germany, so there's a similarity uh, in this respect as well. Uh, five years later, the situation has changed completely. Uh, the highest rate uh, is applied to residential users, households, uh, and is greater than five cents per kilowatt hour, but there has been a generalized increase in all the rates, as you can see. And yet, uh, but yeah, the uh, exemption for the highest level of consum or electricity consumption uh, is still there. 
Okay, now um, this graph shows the uh, evolution of the uh, electricity price paid by a uh, representative household over 2008-2013. This price is has four components, one that corresponds to the price of energy, one to the well, and this is the, the, the green uh, part of the bar. Then there's one, the, the orange component corresponds to the, to a number of, uh, well, to, to the surcharges you, uh, used to finance uh, network expenses, uh, maintenance and investment in the network. The bright blue part uh, corresponds to a number, a variety of uh, surcharges used for <laughs> Uh, various uh, purposes, so uh, generically said system services. And, and then the, the dark blue uh, part corresponds to taxes, so excise taxes and VAT. Now, the uh, A3 surcharge, the renewable A3 surcharge, falls in the bright blue uh, part, okay, the bright blue component. And the main point about this uh, graph is that while we see uh, only a small increase in the full price paid by a uh, consumer, okay, in fact here there's a, a slight decline due to the fall in demand uh, induced by the uh, economic recession, um, the, the, the magnitude of the system services component increases almost monotonically over time and what is behind that? This is due. Uh, what is behind that is the uh, increase of the A3. So this increase over time is driven by the the, the growing cost of support to renewable uh, electricity. Uh, here, uh, well, yes, for the last for the last quarter for which we have data, uh, the weight of the system services component has come to represent 19% of the final uh, price. And uh, if you consider that the A3 is about 90, represents about 90% of this, uh, as a subcomponent of this is at 90% of 3.6, then um, support on renewable electricity has come to, to, to make about 17% of the final price by, uh, or the price paid by uh, households. Now, I would like to ask you uh, a question to, uh, because it's, uh, it's not related to what I've just said, uh, to what I've said so far, but it, it's functional for me. It's functional to introduce um, uh, the empirical application that we, do, that we did in our uh, paper. Okay, so let me launch the, uh, the poll. Okay, so the question is, would you say that energy for home uses, heating, cooking, lighting, etc., is a more necessary good than energy for private transport? A, yes. B, no. They are equally necessary to the same degree. Okay, I'll give you a few seconds to, uh, to answer. Um, well, many are already, uh, have already answered. Uh huh. Very pretty quick. A couple of more seconds. Yeah, if you're, I'll give you a couple of seconds more. Okay, it seems it's uh, it has stabilized to more than to to eighty five percent of votes. Okay, I'll now close the poll. Uh, let's see the results. Okay, so 67% of you think that yes is more unnecessary good, no only for 4%, and 30% think that they are equally necessary. Okay, well, I agree with, uh, with the first, uh, I mean, my guess would, be, would have been the first uh, answer, yes, that uh, energy, energy for home use is, is more unnecessary good compared to uh, motor for energy use in private transport. Now you'll see, the, you'll see now why I think uh, uh, this is useful, this is a, 
usual now to introduce the uh, imperial exercise we did. Okay, so yeah, in our exercise, uh, in our imperial exercise, as I said in the uh, in the first uh, at the beginning of the presentation, we uh, make a comparison between the A3 and a hypothetical carbon tax. A hypothetical, and I say hypothetical because a carbon tax uh, in Italy does not exist as yet. Um, <clears throat> so what is the reasoning about, uh, behind it? Well, a carbon tax uh, that is applied to all fossil, all fossil fuels affects all forms of CO2 related energy use. Okay, therefore it affects also motor fuel, uh, consumption of motor fuels. And to the, extent, to the extent that motor fuels are a less nece necessary good than home fuels, uh, well, the impact of a carbon tax would be less regressive than that of, an elect of the electricity surcharge, of the renewable electricity surcharge. Okay, if, if that is the case, well, then we could argue that replacing the renewable electricity surcharge with a carbon tax, replacing in the sense of uh, using the carbon tax as an alternative means for financing uh, the yield of the carbon tax for financing uh, renewable electricity, support to renewable electricity, well, would be an improvement both on the ground of cost effectiveness in emissions abatement, because a uh, uh, a uniform price on all CO2 emissions, such as a carbon tax, uh, would uh, determine is the most effective way of reducing emissions, but also an improvement on the ground of equity. Okay. Now we want to uh, we wanted so this was our we wanted to test this uh, hypothesis uh, using Italian data. Uh, before, though, I would like to show you this uh, data from Eurostat on uh, on the consumption on the on the budget shares of electricity, gas, and home fuels for the twenty eight EU member states across income distribution. So here on the horizontal axis, you have income the five income quintiles. Each curve corresponds to um, a different uh, EU member state. Um, and what they, each of them represent is the budget share, so the share of total expenditure, uh, or household total expenditure, of this aggregate, aggregate electricity, gas, and other home fuels. As you can see, the importance of consumption, there's a general trend, which says that the importance of consumption of electricity, gas, and other home fuels declines with rising levels, uh, with increasing levels of income, okay? So a price increase in home fuels uh, would have a regressive impact. The opposite is, is, a, is what we see for motor fuels. So I'm not going to discuss, uh, the, the, the picture is uh, analogous to, to the other one, except that here we are considering the aggregate motor fuels. Okay, and here the trend you see is, is, a, is positive, like the, the gradient, the general trend is that the gradient is, is positive. Okay, so um, the impact of a price increase in motor fuels certainly would not be, uh, well, would not be regressive. Okay, then the concept of regressiveness is, um, is a, an average concept, okay. Uh, we'll get that back to this idea uh, later in uh, in the presentation. So these, uh, yeah, this evidence gives the says that the seventy, the sixty-seven percent of people who, of you who uh, said that home fuels are more necessary, are more necessary good, uh, are were right. I mean, were right to uh, think so. Okay, now our empirical analysis. Add two, as two, obje add two objectives. First, to estimate the distributional incidence of the A3 surcharge across income distribution. And secondly, to uh, compare the A3 and hypothetical carbon tax, <coughs> sorry, with respect to distributional incidence. Um, yeah, we do this because we are, uh, I mean, the rationale for doing this is to is that we are thinking of the carbon tax as an alternative way of 
uh, finding the resources to uh, alternative way to the A3 uh, for finding the resources to fund to finance uh, support to renewable electricity. The data we use, well, the, the, the analysis is based on the House of Budget Survey, uh, the Italian House of Budget Survey from year 2011. Just one word, one quick word on the methodology. For each household, we, we worked out the burden of the A3 and of the carbon tax in the following way. We simply multiply the rate of the, uh, of the A3 by electricity consumption and divide by uh, total expenditure of the household. And similarly for the carbon tax, we multiply the carbon tax rate by CO2 emissions embedded in, in, a, in the household's uh, energy consumption and divide by total expenditure. Yes, so CO2 emissions are where are those embedded in direct energy consumption, namely of home fuels and motor fuels. And the analysis is a, I mean, is a static one, it's limited to, to consumption patterns and we do not take behavioral response into account. Okay, so I'll show you the main results of this analysis. This graph, uh, shows the cost of the A3 and of the carbon tax, average cost uh, across income distribution. These are the income with deciles, or more precisely, the total expenditure deciles. And uh, the costs are expressed as euros uh, in euros per month per adult. So you can see that the A3 costs more for the lower part, uh, households in the lower part of the income distribution more compared to, uh, compared to the carbon tax. And the opposite is true for the upper part of the distribution where, for which it's the carbon tax that costs uh, more than the, uh, than the electricity surcharge, renew renewable electricity surcharge. Now, in order to appreciate the uh, degree of regressiveness of the two, the A3 and the carbon tax, we express this cost as a proportion of, of total expenditure, okay? Um, we can see here that the uh, impact of the A3 is significantly more regressive than that of the carbon tax because it's much bigger the relative impact, the relative burden for the, for the poorest household compared to the, uh, to the burden for the richest household in the case of the, of the A3. Well, there's not as big a difference for, uh, for the carbon tax. Yes, the carbon tax has still a, a, a regressive impact because these, these burdens, this burden is decreasing with higher level of income, but definitely to a, a, it's to a, less, to a, a smaller degree. Okay? So the A3 is more regressive than a carbon tax. This is reflected in the, also in the, in the first 10 decile ratio, which is a measure of uh, one way of measuring uh, the regressiveness. Uh, 3.5 for the uh, A3, and it's two, about two for the carbon tax. And this, I mean, what drives this result is the fact that motor fuels are less necessary good than electricity. You see that, uh, I, I haven't shown it here, but the data show that uh, motor fuel consumption increases with, uh, with income, uh, different fr uh, much more than electricity consumption, relatively more than electricity consumption. And that is due to, to the fact that uh, richer households are more cars, are, are pro on, average, uh, on average use more, or at least we presume that's, that, that's because they are more cars, they use uh, cars more, um, poor houses may not even have a, uh, the poorest, uh, not, not even have a, their own means of transportation. So that's the factor uh, uh, underlying the, 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 these uh, results. And then also, it, it, this is not, what I'm going to say is not uh, visible in these graphs, but it's, uh, it's uh, I think it's important to point out uh, still. Uh, and it's the fact that we observe high variation of effects within the deciles. 
and less but much less variation for the under the carbon tax. Uh, and this is, this is the case because the base of the carbon tax is diverse. It impacts on, on petrol, on gas, on electricity, and not just on electricity. So uh, the, the, that's more, uh, the impact is more equally uh, uh, distributed. Now, we replicated the, essentially we replicated the same uh, analysis, but just differentiating, uh, but separately, for the north and, uh, and south of Italy. Uh, we did it also for central regions, but the north and south are the extreme cases, so it's more interesting to, to compare these. Okay, here we see this graph refers to the northern regions, and uh, this is the, the cost of the A3 and the carbon tax as a share of total expenditure. We see that the carbon tax uh, costs more all across the distribution than the A3, except for the lowest uh, decile. But uh, the, the difference in degree of regressiveness is not, is not uh, big. Um, the picture is completely different from, uh, it's pretty different for southern regions, where we see that the, first of all, the carbon tax costs more than the, sorry, the A3 costs more than the carbon tax for all households, from the poorest to the richest, and, and the degree of regressiveness of the A3 is clearly uh, higher than for the carbon tax, okay, as the gradient of the line intersecting the blue bars uh, demonstrates. Um, it's an interesting point to, to observe though that the, uh, but the, the incidence of the carbon tax in the north and in the south is not that different. Why? <clears throat> okay, well, this is just the... Uh, <clears throat> uh, it says what I've just said before, that the incidence of the A3 is <clears throat> almost twice as big in the south uh, than, in the, than in the north. Um, yeah, and the, the reason why there, the reason why the incidence of the carbon tax is similar in the two regions uh, is due to the ultimately due to the fact that the base of the carbon tax is diverse. Okay, uh, as I said before, it impacts on all forms of uh, on all energy on all fuel, fossil fuels, and uh, and so what underlies this results is, okay, the difference between the north and the south are two. Well, um, the difference in income levels in the south, they are lower, and the difference in energy consumption, uh, and spe specifically in that in the south, less gas is consumed for heating purposes. Um, so essentially with a carbon tax, um, the fact that less energy is consumed, notably gas, uh, makes, up, makes for the compensates uh, or makes for the lower level of, uh, of income. Okay. Okay, we now move to the uh, conclusions and, uh, and some general, more general remarks. Well, the findings of our, of, uh, our uh, empirical research, uh, empirical exercise are that the simulated carbon tax is significantly less aggressive than the A3. The relative impact of the search of the A3 in the south is significantly bigger and more aggressive than in the north. And the cost of the carbon tax is more equally distributed within income groups and across regions. So, so this leads us to, uh, to formulate our recommendation which is to replace the uh, A3 surcharge with a carbon tax. This would bring about an imp a double improvement, both uh, a double improvement, well, in, in terms of cost effectiveness in emissions abatement, uh, because you would have a carbon tax on all uh, emissions, and equity. So it would be a, a double improvement on the current 
uh, on the current system as it is. Now, before uh, yeah, before um, the general the the, remark, the final remarks, I would like to ask you um, a second question. Okay, I'm now going to launch the poll. Okay, you would be happier to pay a carbon tax if the revenue A. was used for what the government thinks is best B. was used for financing investment in renewables or energy efficiency C. was used for something specific other than B, which you think is more important D. you don't mind what the revenue is used for Okay um, I, I, I'm, I'm generally interested in uh, in your answers because it's not fun uh, I, I think it's really an open question in the also in the, in the empirical literature and uh, in the policy debate uh, what to do with the uh, with the revenues of a, of a carbon tax and whether these has any impact on the acceptability of the tax so it's relevant for the policy recommendation that we that I just said in the previous uh, uh, slide Okay, most of you, well, no, I'll give you a, a, a few more seconds. Um, okay, that's very interesting, the, the result that I get. Okay, a couple more seconds. Okay, well, it seems all of you who want to answer have done it. I'll close it now and share the results with you. Okay, so it turns out that 80% of you uh, would be happier to pay a carbon tax if the revenue was, was used for a green, uh, let's say, green uh, investment. Now, I'm very, uh, and only, t and I'm surprised by the low, uh, the low 10% for uh, for using the the revenues for whatever you think uh, would is best. Um, okay. Okay. Well, I I think that that's comforting for uh, this result is comforting for the policy um, that we recommend because I mean we are saying to you we are saying that the revenue of the carbon tax should be used for uh, for financing renewable uh, electricity. So I think it's yeah, it's comforting in a in that respect. Um, okay, some some final remarks. Well, first, in Italy, in Italy, fossil fuels are already heavily taxed. So if you are going to do if you're if you were going to introduce a, a carbon tax, I think that a overall of the current system of excise tax of, ex, of the of excise taxes should be. Uh, should be done before uh, the carbon tax is introduced. And there is scope for that, there is scope for that. Um, because uh, current excise rates are not, uh, do not reflect the uh, environmental damage really. Uh, but it was, they were conceived as ways of raising revenue. Um, yeah. Arguably, a carbon tax is more transparent than a bill surcharge, especially in cases like Italy, where in the electricity bill you have uh, not just one surcharge, but uh, many surcharges. So there is a problem with transparency, and I think that a carbon tax would, uh, would be an improvement on that. And also, arguably, tax marking or revenue recycling makes green taxes more popular. And you, uh, the result of your uh, answers uh, confirm this this idea. Also, this um, <clears throat> something that I think it's, it, it seems to be forgotten in the, uh, in, in, in the debate, in this debate, is that support to renewable electricity is ultimately justified by public policy objectives like environmental protection, energy security. So really, ideally, its costs should be covered by the government budget. 
Okay, I know that there are, fina there are financial constraints on the, on the government budget, but then I would say, I would argue that the, the reform that we recommend would at least bring a double improvement on the, on the current system. The, current, the double improvement being um, cost efficiency in emissions abatement and uh, a better distributional impact on households. Okay, here my uh, presentation ends and I hope you find it of interest. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefano. And now it's time to start the Q&A section. I would like to just say that there were many questions and also comments submitted during the webinar. And unfortunately, we won't have time to, to read all of them. But as you can see on the slides right now, there is an email to Stefano. And you can email him after the webinar uh, to ask him directly your questions. And maybe then you can also have a discussion on this topic. Uh, but let's go quickly to the question number one. And the question number one is, Aren't there other ways to make RESI support less regressive? Uh, well, yeah, yes, for sure. Uh, well, there's one that um, probably the most, uh, yeah, the most, the most intuitive. I mean, the most the obvious one is to essentially to take out the exemptions of of, of the, uh, the exemptions that are in place. And that I showed in the along the present in the in the present before in the presentation, uh, we know that uh, the high levels of consumption or electricity consumption are exempted from the uh, from the paying the surcharge. So uh, taking out these exemptions would uh, widen basically the base of the the base, and so the the burden would be would be as a result would be lower on a, essentially the burden would be distributed on a on wider shoulders, on on more shoulders. So uh, this would be a way of of, uh, of reducing the, the the regressiveness of uh, of the surcharge. Um, but I think that our, our proposal is uh, as an advantage over this uh, solution because uh, it would re we would really kill two uh, two birds with one stone because we would have with a carbon tax we would also have an efficient. Uh, um, uh, a most cost-effective way of emissions abatement, and uh, it would be a meaningful way of combining the two uh, the two pillars of the uh, of the of the EU strategy: uh, emissions reduction and uh, support to renewable energy. Thank you very much. And the next question is: Would the carbon tax still allow Italy to reach its 2020 RESI targets, or any targets beyond 2020? Uh, well, I think that it. Uh, yes, I mean, uh, I mean, a carbon tax as we as, as we propose it, it's uh, would be used for. Um, well, I, I think it would actually help to meeting the targets. So. I don't see how a carbon tax could uh, uh, like be a hindering to uh, the reaching of of the of an emission reduction target. So it's not that a carbon tax would be an alternative to, especially in the way we 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 recommend recommend it would be alternative to support renewable electricity. Could be used for I mean the yield could be used for supporting supporting renewable electricity. Um, just in in place of the uh, of the electricity surcharge, which is particularly regressive, and the carbon tax is uh, well, it's 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 regressive or neutral, uh, but less regressive than the electricity surcharge, and that's what we wanted to uh, to show. Uh, no, I don't think it would be a an injury at all. In fact, it would be a <laughs> it would help to reach that uh, that target. Okay, thank you. Next question. How would replacing the A3 tax by carbon tax would impact the market of distributed small-scale generation and storage? Small-scale generation? And storage, yes. And storage. Well, so I would impact on, on supply, basically, on supply of electri on electricity supply. Mm, well, small-scale generation would not be affected because the uh, support to renewable electricity, I mean, would still be there. Like, I'm not saying that the feeding tariff, uh, the feeding tariffs, the other schemes in support to renewable electricity should be scrapped. I mean, what I'm, what I'm suggesting is that just the way of financing those would be uh, different. Instead of uh, through an electricity surcharge, 
it would be it would be from uh, it would be with a carbon tax. So it shouldn't have a a big impact a, a big impact on uh, on the supply uh, side. At least it doesn't have an obvious uh, impact on uh, supply like on re on electricity generation. Okay, thank you. I think we have time still for two more questions. And the next question is, uh, Stefano, do you know what is the proportion of governments in the European Union who favor the use carbon taxes to finance generation from low carbon sources? Well, for the government, I, uh, concerning government, I don't know. Um, carbon tax is always a... <clears throat> a, 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 a well, I, I, I imagine, I, I, my guess is that the European Commission would be in favor of a, of a, of a solution of, the, of this kind as we propose it, because it's pretty consistent with their proposal of, of um, amend, amendment of the Energy tax, Taxation Directive, where they recommend, they suggested to um, uh, have a carbon tax in the non uts sector and and suggested to use the revenue for uh, environmental uh, environmental purposes. So uh, I think that the uh, at the EU level they would be the, I mean, they would welcome the, they are, they would be largely at least in agreement. Uh, but governments, well, it's uh, I mean the, uh, to be honest, I don't know. In the single single governments may have different positions, and uh, a carbon tax is always difficult to. Uh, to get accepted, and uh, an electricity surcharge instead is uh, because of the of the question of visibility. I think it's easier to to be imposed. Yeah, that's a bit sad, but mm -hmm. thank you. Okay, so now it's time for the last question, and I would appreciate the brief answer, Stefano. <laughs> okay, so how would the analysis change with green certificates instead of feed-in tariffs? Okay, well, the the I think that. Mm. Uh, I think that if you have a, a, an electricity surcharge like the A3, then it's, it, wa it's, it was easier for us to do the, uh, the simulation uh, because, well, you know what the rate is and uh, you just apply to electricity consumption. So uh, you know how much every household paid uh, to support renewable electricity. Uh, whereas, but, but the... But it would it would be like it would be more difficult empirically uh, if only green certificates were in place, um, because the impact of the of, of uh, green certificates on the final price paid by uh, households is filtered uh, is filtered by the wholesale market. Okay, so one would have to one would have to take this uh, into account. If you assume that the, pr the cost of green certificates for, green for traditional generators uh, is fully, sweet, uh, fully passed on to, to, uh, to, fi on to the cons final consumers, then uh, well, the analysis would be, would be pretty similar. So I think empirically it would be more difficult to, to do the, uh, the simulation, but uh, in, in conceptually, uh, there would be not, there wouldn't be a, a real difference because you always have a, a, a price, in, a price increase on the final price paid by, uh, by, by the final consumer. Thank you very much, Stefano. Thank you. You're welcome.